All right, so I'm just going to cross over. We do have on Zoom with us this morning uh, Barbados Ambassador to CARICOM, uh, David Commission, because, of course, last Wednesday, Mia Motley went back to the polls and the Barbados Labour Party. And as a result of that, we saw a clean sweep. 30 seats, 30 seats won by the Barbados Labour Party. And we just wanted to know what this fresh mandates mean for the people of Barbados. Good morning to you, Mr. Commission. Good morning. Good morning, Natalie. It's a pleasure to be here. Yes. Happy New Year to you. It's been a while. <laughs> yes, yes. I've been, I've been very busy. <laughs> First with I the know, Republic. I know, I know. Well, and then with the election. Talk to us. The elections are over now. What does this fresh mandate mean for the people of Barbados? Well, the Prime Minister was very clear. Um, we have some very difficult issues on our plate. Um, first of all, um, getting through to the end of the COVID-19 pandemic with as little loss of life as possible. Um, also seeing our IMF program through to a successful um, conclusion. Um, dealing with climate change, we have the climate crisis. We have already begun to experience the effects of global warming, so putting adaptation measures in, in place, yeah. and, uh, and and then the, the a whole program of transformation of Barbados and the and the Barbadian economy. So she said she wanted to get the silly season of you know partisan politicking out of the way, so that we can the government can have a clear five year period to focus on this very serious agenda and to have the Barbadian people unified behind the government um, in, in going forward with this very serious agenda. And she achieved it. Yes, and it's obvious the people have spoken. Obviously, the unity is there. I can't remember the last time we saw in an election in the Caribbean where we get in that kind of, not only the fact that she won 30 seats, but the margins by which she won those seats. But were there some internal wranglings within the party before that caused her to, to decide to go back to the polls? No, no, that was just um, opposition um, propaganda. No, Ms. Motley is very much in charge of her party. Her, her leadership is unquestioned, and um, there's a tremendous amount of confidence by um, her party and her, her MPs in her as, as a leader. So, you know, a lot of little foolish um, partisan um, or propaganda. There was, there was really nothing to it. Um, mm -hmm. We have to take her at her word. She said she had 18 months more to go on her, on her term. And we had already begun to see signs that that 18 month period was being treated as an electioneering period. So we were beginning to see a, a lot of political opportunism um, a lot of grandstanding, uh, um, attempts to defy and, and derail uh, the government's agenda, particularly what was most disturbing, um, uh, attempts to, to defy that agenda in relation to the COVID-19 national program. And yeah. so she said, look, um, this is not, I, I, I'm not liking this. Uh, if these folk really want an election, let's give them Let's give them the election as soon as possible so that the country can settle, settle back down. So it had nothing to do with um, any internal um, opposition to her within the, the Barbados Labour Party. So what was the reason for uh, one of her MPs crossing the floor? No, 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 no MP has crossed the floor. One of the MPs crossed the floor in 2018. When, when you remember, in 2018, the Barbados Labour Party also won all of the seats, and um, one of the one of the MPs who was not given a ministry decided that it made sense for him um, to leave the party and make himself leader of the opposition. Well, I mean, he, he got a bigger salary by being leader of the opposition, and so he 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 subsequently went on to form his own party. He became leader of the opposition in the House of Assembly. He was able to uh, appoint two senators um, to the Senate of Barbados. And he served as, uh, an, as an opposition party for the three and a half years. 
Um, no doubt, um, as expected, he was roundly rejected at the polls. So he's, he is now a thing of the past. Um, so yes, yeah, so we don't we don't have any any opposition. Um, the president of Barbados has the power to appoint um, two opposition senators uh, in her own in her own discretion, and um, where the constitution provides for consultation between the president and the leader of the opposition in certain matters, the president uh, the constitution does provide where there is no leader of the opposition. She has the power to act in her own discretion. So, and, and that's what I was wondering. That's what I was wondering about, David. How how difficult or dangerous do you think it is to have a government without an opposition in place to have those checks and balances? Yeah. Well, you know, the, the strength of a democracy is really in its institutions, all of its institutions, not not just the the, the political party. If I may give an example, um, during the course of last year, the institution that was perhaps most effective and most impressive in responding to government's um, policy um, around COVID-19, sometimes challenging government, questioning government's protocols, sometimes getting government to, 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 to back off and to make changes, that institution was not was not the um, political opposition. That institution was the Barbados Association of Medical Practitioners, you yeah. know, the professional body of the of the medical practitioners of Barbados. So I, I remember, I mean, years ago, I I led a, a, a small political party. We had we had no presence in parliament, but during the period of about a year, when the official opposition party was mired in internal crisis, we stepped forward and we essentially performed the role of the opposition um, from, from our position outside of parliament. So the point is, um, we have to look at all of the institutions of the society. If the institutions, the, the trade unions, the newspapers, the professional um, organizations, the various civil society organizations, if they step up to the plate and, and play their rightful role, um, there will be there will be checks and, and balances. There will be an informed um, public opinion that will hold the government accountable. Well, I, I wait to see how that goes, but it's obvious that Mia Motley has the things that she wants to do. What are some of those things that she wants to accomplish in the next five years that she went back to the poll for a fresh mandate so that she could get to them? Well, as I, as I indicated, I mean, the three big defensive things are the national COVID-19 um, program and how to get us through this with as little loss of life as possible. We are in an IMF program, um, it, uh, but we sold the IMF our own homegrown program. It's called the Barbados Economic Recovery and Transformation Plan. So how do we take that through to a successful um, conclusion? and how do we deal with the negative effects of, of global warming that have already begun to impact us? So those are three um, yeah. defensive things. But then there's then there's the forward-looking transformation agenda, and um, they, this administration has put a lot of emphasis on ownership. That there's going to be an ownership revolution in Barbados where. At, at every stage, government is going to be looking to facilitate not only Barbadian ownership, but working class um, ownership. Um, we are also, uh, another big feature of the program going forward is renewable energy, not only to develop a renewable energy industry, but how do we use renewable energy and renewable energy technology as instruments for social and economic um, transformation. So this is, a, this is a big part of the agenda going forward. Um, we're going to use renewable energy to spark a housing revolution in Barbados. Um, we're, we're talking, you know, 10, uh, 11,000 um, new houses made accessible to working class people by using renewable energy. The, the, the big, the, the, the central idea is that a person will not have to actually pay for the land. 
the, all they have to do is give government permission to put a solar panel on the roof. The mm. solar panel will generate energy that will be sold to the national grid, and that will be used to pay off to pay off for the land. So it's going to make home ownership much more accessible. We're also looking at putting solar panels on 50,000 houses of, of poor people, um, working class people, to generate, to sell the energy to the national grid, to generate a stream of income um, for, working, um, for working class people. Then there are plans for a, a new heritage um, industry, um, educa uh, education industry, education as a foreign exchange earning industry. So there's some very, very um, innovative ideas to really transform Barbados, to make Barbados, the Barbadian economy, much more diversified and to bring the ethic of ownership, not just employment now, but yeah. Barbadians actually owning assets. Um, so it's, it's going to be a very exciting um, five years. And if we do it well, um, in five years' time, we should really see a much stronger, much more resilient, much more equal and egalitarian Barbados. Well, I think at this point, most people can say that we're already seeing the changes because when we look at Barbados' debt, uh, having one of the highest debts in the world, and that under Motley, it was able to even start to trending downwards already. I think people are definitely looking forward to, you know, what she has in store for, for Bayesians, you know, going forward. But on the COVID front, I know that there were issues with people, you know, accepting the vaccines, getting vaccinated, and, you know, just treating with the COVID-19 protocols. Where are we now? What percentage of the population is vaccinated? Uh, we are, we are, we are uh, close to 70%. Um, no, we, Barbados has done quite well. Um, um, the Barbados government has resisted calls to mandate vaccines. Um, what, what we have said is, look, um, critical to, to fighting this COVID pandemic is to keep our people united. So we don't want to divide our people. We don't want to sow bitterness and opposition to the um, national um, program. So we have gone the route, rather than mandating vaccines, we have put a lot of emphasis on persuasion, on education. Um, the prime minister's even, you know, gone to the extent of visiting various um, facilities, speaking to, speaking to workers, um, encouraging them to, to be vaccinated. So what we have found is that, you know, the, the vaccine program has gone quite smoothly. Initially, when we first, um, when COVID first hit, we were saying if we could vaccinate 70% of the population, that that would be acceptable. I think we have, we have raised our ambition a bit more now. We, we want to do more than 70. I think we want to look more like 80 and 80 plus. Um, but so we are getting there, we are getting there, and we are getting there through public education and persuasion as opposed to, um, you know, going the route of, of government mandating. Yeah. And, and, and we have basically kept the people united. We haven't, we haven't seen in Barbados the kind of um, opposition and division and bitterness that you have seen in some other countries, including some Caribbean countries. Yeah. All right, Mr. Commissioner, thank you so much for speaking with us this morning. Of course, we'll check in with you from time to time so that we can get an update on what's happening in Barbados. But for now, definitely looking like things are on the right track. Yes, uh, yes, yes. We're very happy. I'm really looking forward to what the next five years will bring for Barbados. And I'd be happy to come in and, and, and speak about whatever progress or whatever setbacks we are experiencing. Yes. All right, David, thank you so much. All right, guys, stay with us. We go to a short break and we'll be right back.